Hallelujah. Well, uh, I don't mind receiving congratulations from ministers and ministries like that. That over the years, 25, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, they've been faithful to the people of God and they've been faithful to the kingdom of God. Amen. Even though they're not here, please give Kenneth, Keith, and John Bevere a big hand clap, would you? Amen. Friends and uh, relationships that we've developed over the years, along with many, many others. I was thinking about uh, when Miss and I were, Kenneth Copeland Ministries, we went to Atlanta to do a, we were with Brother Copeland at the time, we went to Atlanta, and, and I remember uh, this was probably 35 years ago, and uh, we decided, we were there early, so we decided to go to Creflo Dollars Church on Wednesday night. He had services back then. And he was meeting in an old Baptist, red brick, old Baptist church, seated about 300, pews, and uh, we, were the, we were the minority when we walked in there. And, and I know what it feels like, and, uh, but the graciousness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the love, the kindness, I was thinking about that last night. And just the relationships that Missy and I have built over the years with such great men and women of God that have been so faithful. I remember when Joyce Meyer came to Missy when she was a, a director over publications and over media at Kenneth Copeland Ministry said, what must I do? I remember when Jesse DePlanis came and said, what must I do to expand our television ministry? At that time, Missy just gave them some simple true, some simple facts. But she did it out of faith, and it moved their ministry. Jesse talks about the time he sat down with Missy so long ago, and uh, he talks about how he said, well, I want to buy a, a jet, and, a, and, and I want to expand my television ministry. And he said, I don't know which to do first. And Missy said to him, do both. And he goes around teaching it even today. He said, that changed the trajectory of my ministry. Would you give my wife a big case? Like I'm here to tell you today that I could not do it, could not have done it without Missy. Missy Niece Johnson. I love you. You know, we built this ministry and this church on Mark 9, 23. All things are possible to him who believes. The second thing we built it on is it's not about religion. It's about relationship. And the third thing that is threaded throughout our foundation is bringing God and people together. These are the things that we hold as, as three points uh, three connecting points that we always look back to and we also always make sure we stay focused on. You are in a place, in a room, in an atmosphere that has been prepared by prayer and a relationship with God where we put the relationship with God before anybody else. Amen. This is just the calling that's on my life. I will risk relationships at the expense of having my number one priority on my relationship with God. And I do that for you, and I do that for us. Amen? And I, I just appreciate you understanding that, just how critical that is, especially in the day and hours that we live in. In light of Mark nine twenty three, I want to remind you of something Paul said in Hebrews, the second chapter. Notice he said, Then God add his, added his witness to theirs, now, that's saying something right there. I could preach a message. It's one thing to witness about God. It's another thing to God, for God to witness about you. And this is how he witnessed about them. He validated their ministry. How do you think he did it? He did it with power, with signs, astonishing wonders, all kinds of powerful miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which he distributed as he desired. And so many denominations would say to you today, all these things that are spoken of here are passed away with the apostles. That healing is to be hoped for, not to be believed in. The miraculous and the supernatural is simply an un unexplained coincidence. 
But I am standing here, and let me be clear today that I am in opposition against that religious rhetoric because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He did supernatural back then, the miraculous back then, and he's still doing it today. These supernatural things, what are they? Signs, wonders, miracles, healings, deliverances. What are they? They're the works. And Jesus said, and greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father which is in heaven. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You see, here at Pathpoint, the miraculous is common. How many of you since you've been here, I don't care if you've been here a month, but since you've been here, you've had an answer to prayer, you've had a miracle, you've had a healing, you've had a deliverance. Don't just raise your hand to me. Stand up, every single one of you, because God wants to repeat the miracles we talk about. Amen. Look across this room at all the, all the things that God's done. Amen. Give the Lord's shout in this house. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. You may be seated. Thank you for that. Just as God validated authentic ministry back in those days, this is still how God validates authentic ministry. And yet if you look across the landscape of many ministries and churches, they bypass this part. They bypass the signs, the wonders, the miracles, the healings, the deliverances. They bypass word of knowledge. They bypass redemptive gifts. They bypass the spiritual gifts on their way to the word. But remember, Paul said this. He said, my speech and my preaching is not with eloquency of speech. It's not with convincing words or persuasive words of human wisdom. He said, but in the demonstration and the power of the Holy Ghost that men's faith, people's faith, would stand in the power of God. And I ask the people here at Pathpoint all the time, if you're new with us today, where have you built your faith? It better not just be in this. It better be in the power of the uncompromised Word of God so you've experienced the power from this book. Amen. Now, what does that require? Here's the word of God. It's uncompromised. And then here's your experience that the power of God has produced. What does it require? The only way to experience the power of God is you're going to have to build a bridge. What is that bridge? The bridge of faith. The bridge of faith. That's the only way. The only thing God requires of you is faith. Trust in him. Amen. How many of you believe that today? Now, one of the things we've learned along the way that what we do requires heavenly wisdom. Not human wisdom, heavenly wisdom. Not things that make sense. We want to see through the Holy Spirit's perspective, not our own. You see, heavenly wisdom sees beyond the surface. It sees what others can't see. It sees beyond the obvious. It sees to the root of that person's problem or to the core of that issue. And this is what we have yielded to uh, uh, from the very beginning, we because we've been so dependent upon him, he's the only one that could do. Well, I'm not smart enough. I'm not good looking enough. I'm not educated enough. I don't have the skills enough to do what God's called me to do. But how many know he said that he uses the weak to confound the wise? I qualify. Amen. I qualify. And so in that, uh, over the years, we've, we've come to understand some things. Uh, 25 years ago, I want you to think about it just a minute. 25 years ago, that may not seem like a long time to you. Sometimes it seems like it was just yesterday. Other times it seems like it was an eternity. Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Amen. But over 25 years ago, I remember it was in the middle of the night, and the Holy Spirit woke me up by saying something to me, and it was so powerful and it was so impressed upon my soul that it literally woke me up. It was like an audible voice. And so I just turned over and went back to sleep until the next night he did it again. And then finally I got the point. He's going to keep doing this. So I took a notebook and a pen and I put it by my bed. And sure enough, the next night he woke me up and he gave me a scripture. And I wrote that scripture down. The next night, he woke me up with just a statement. The next night, he woke me up with, with an image, a picture, and I drew that picture out. The next night, he woke me up, and he gave me a couple of paragraphs. The next night, three paragraphs. And so this went on for five months, every single night, 
almost at 3 o'clock in the morning every night on cue. He would wake me up with such an audible voice that I would be sound asleep. And you can ask Missy, I'm a sound sleeper. It takes a lot to wake me up. And so, um, anyway, he would wake me up like that. And, and uh, about five months into it, he said, now go back to the first, because I hadn't taken the time to do this. And he said, read through that. And as I read through that, uh, I started seeing a kingdom pattern. And I started seeing that the Lord was calling Missy and I to this Amarillo area. And so we moved here. And the first couple of years, I, you know, Missy would be in the kitchen or she'd be in the laundry room or somewhere in the house, maybe in the bedroom, making the bed or something. And I'd walk in on her and I'd hear her saying, she didn't know I was there, I heard her say, I trust you, God. Now notice, gentlemen, she didn't say, I trust you, Scott. See, I needed her faith in God, not in me. Just like my faith wasn't in her, but was in God. And we live this way every day of our lives. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, uh, one of the things that you know about me is I was raised in church. My dad became a pastor when I was nine years old. You remember me talking about how devout my mom was and how she would take her kids to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And one of the things that I, I got to figuring out is that Christians, they really know, they really get church. Christians know what to do and what not to do. They know what works and what doesn't work. They get church. They just don't get what it takes for God to create the church. Furthermore, they don't get what it takes for God to build the church that Jesus is coming back for. Christians have it wrong. I told this to a class of 40 or 50 teachers on Tuesday night. Uh, these teachers are part of our associate. The Bible says that Jesus is coming back for a glorious church. He didn't say he's coming back for Christians. He said he's coming back for a gathering of people that is the church. And he said, everything that we're doing, this is the Holy Spirit now talking to me, he said, everything that we're doing, that I'm doing with the church, is, is I'm preparing them for the presentation. Because Jesus is going to present the glorious church to himself as his bride. And then I thought, isn't that interesting? All these people that got saved during Jesus' ministry, and yet only 120 show up in the upper room, and only they experience the first event with the Holy Ghost. He's come back for the church, the glorious church. And Scripture tell us, tells us the glorious church is seven times brighter, seven times greater than the book of Acts church, the first church. We're going to be doing seven times the work seven times the ministry, and we're going to be doing all to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Give him praise in this house. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, in 25 years, I have never shared this with you, and the Holy Spirit said you need to tell them. Early on, the Holy Spirit showed me Deuteronomy, the 22nd chapter, and from time to time, about every other year, he'll take me to Deuteronomy 22, and he said to tell you what he told me so many years ago. He said, he told me back then, he said, the reason I want you to know and understand this is because this will keep you from veering off the path. And so look at Deuteronomy, the 22nd chapter. Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seed or mixed seed, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of wool and, and linen together. And so what we see here is every ministry, every church, as far as God is concerned, is a vineyard. Path Point Fellowship Church is a vineyard. Amen? And so he says that there's a principle here, that God does not approve or accept churches with mixed seed. Are you listening? 
This is why over the years I refuse to mix religious rhetoric with the gospel. I refuse to do it. I refuse to use persuasive words, human wisdom, and to weave it into the gospel. I refuse to use eloquency of speech or convincing words. I've had people come to me and talk to me and, and, and would ask me questions and the Holy Spirit would up out of my mouth, I'd hear my, up out of my spirit, I'd hear my mouth say, I'm not here to convince you anything. You have the Holy Spirit. You listen to what he's saying. This is what my spiritual father, Kenneth Copeland, used to say to me. He said, you know, just because I preach this to you, don't believe it. Take the word and, pre- and, and find it out for yourself if it's true. Amen. Because he doesn't validate church with the words coming out of somebody's mouth. He validates it through signs, wonders, miracles, healings, deliverances. Amen. And so notice what he said. And and I've held true to this. He said, don't weave a garment with two types of fabric. Of linen and of wool. Wool represents religious effort. Linen represents spiritual purity. He says, tell your people that for 25 years, I keep bringing you back to this because I want them to know I don't accept, even though it looks like, because see, uh, we measure in, in the capitalism, we measure our success by numbers and by money. Huh? And by how many come to our meetings. He said, God said to me, I don't measure it that way. Huh? I measure it by, is your vineyard full of mixed seed? Or is it full of uncompromised word of God? Amen. Hallelujah. This should give you comfort and confidence of what the Lord is doing here at Pathpoint Fellowship Church. Amen. Now, (laughs) I've thought back over the years, of course, in this last couple of days, and just thought of all the things that the Lord has done in the people's lives throughout these 25 years. Been so thankful and appreciative, but I can stand here as a leader and say to you as the founder and the and the senior pastor of this church, we have done nothing but sow the uncompromised word of God throughout these 25 years. Give the Lord praise in this house. Celebrate that with me, will you? Hallelujah. Is he faithful? Yes, that means he's been faithful to you. Now, you had to make a choice because the Holy Spirit was, was, uh, he was leading you and guiding you. Well, he will never lead you and guide you where there's not truth. He will only lead and guide you to truth. But it's still your decision whether you go to truth or not. Amen. Where truth is preached, there is a validation of that authenticity and it's validated by God himself. Amen. Do you see it? Now, <laughs> praise God, your faithful father. I just want to yield to the Holy Spirit. Somebody here today is in transition. And you're at a major, uh, I had this yesterday as I was praying in spirit. And you're, in a, you're at a major crossroads in your life. And the Lord would say to you, you've been faithful in the previous season. But now I'm here to acknowledge that you're coming into a new season. Another way you could say that, you've been faithful in the previous chapter. Now you're coming into a new chapter in your life. Don't be afraid of that, says the Lord. Who is that? Who is that in this house? If if that's you and you're bold enough to answer the call, uh, go ahead and stand up if that's you. Okay? Okay. I've shared this over the years about transition. Just like God was faithful in your past, he will be faithful in your future. 
He's not moving you to the next thing for it to be less than the, the, the thing you've been doing. It's a greater thing. Now, what does the word say? To whom much is given, you need to look at this. This is a promotion by God. This is a promotion, Cheryl, by God. I don't care how old you are. If you, if you, take, if you take where you're at in your life, and, it does, and if you'll throw out the ideologies and the philosophies of humanity, and you'll listen to what God says. Moses didn't start his earthly ministry until he was 80 years old. I could give you current people uh, that started their, uh, their business when they were 56 years old, 60 years old. See, we think you've got to do this at an early age. But I want you to understand, you're in transitional purpose because God is announcing to you a different season in your life. And this season, you're going to like it much better than the previous one. Amen. So take comfort in that and take faith and confidence in that in Jesus' name. And if you'll do it, you'll go into it by faith instead of, by, instead of being apprehensive and fearful. If you'll do that, God will do what he intended. Amen. Say, it, say this out loud, those of you who are standing. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I receive the new season. I take it by faith. I don't even look back. But to you, Father. Be all the glory and all the praise for the next chapter of my life. The best is coming into my days ahead, my weeks and months ahead in Jesus' name, and I receive them from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord praise in this house. You can be seated. Hallelujah. I got excited about that. Hallelujah. I got stuck over in prayer yesterday, and I prayed in that for about 20 minutes just in the spirit. And I could not. I'd come out of it, and I'd go back to uh, preaching, and, and he'd take me right back into it. So the Lord has you on his mind. Amen. He has you on his mind. Now, <laughs> the devil wants to keep you in bondage. He wants to keep people in bondage and he will fight to keep you sick. He will go to war to keep you, to get you offended, to keep you in offense, to keep you in discouragement and disappointment and depression and in doubt. He will go to war. He will battle to keep you financially broke. Why? Because he wants to keep you in bondage. But if you will stay full of faith, even though the struggle is real, if you'll stay in faith in the midst of the struggle and don't lean to your own understanding, but just keep trusting in God, then here's what the Lord would say to you. He said, I'll have the final say, and you'll like what I'm saying. You'll have the final out. I'll have the final outcome, said the Lord. Amen. Now we see this throughout Scripture. We see this all the time. We see it when uh, God's people, the nation of Israel, there they were in Egypt, in bondage. And look at what uh, look at what the word says about that. It says that Moses, God raised up a man by the name of Moses. Remember, we talked a little bit about this last week. You remember uh, several weeks ago, I went on vacation. I was on vacation for about three weeks, and during that time, the Holy Spirit said to me, now I'm going to reteach you Israel's deliverance during this time you're off. I said, well, thank you. And so he said, now when I reteach you this, I'm going to want for you to reteach your people Israel's deliverance. He said, remember, Moses came with a prophetic word from God, came to the king of the greatest man and all the, the most powerful man in all the world, king of Egypt, Pharaoh. And he came with four words from God, let my people go. This teaches us what? It teaches us that before God does anything, he'll communicate to his people through prophetic words. Before there's a change of seasons, he will prophesy to you. 
He'll give you prophetic words. He'll tell you it's coming before it's coming if you're listening and if you're the right place where prophecy is believed in and, 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 and the prophetic is being allowed to be ministered. Amen? And so what was Pharaoh's response to God's let my people go? Well, his response was call the taskmasters in, tell them, to go and tell the Israelites that from now on, you're going to be harvesting your own straw to make your bricks. No longer are we going to bring them to your mud pits. You're going to have to go out into the field. You're going to bring that straw to the mud pits yourself. Now, if you run out of straw, go ahead and keep making bricks because the reality is this. Don't come up one brick short of your quota on a daily basis. See, many times when God gives a prophetic word, things look worse before they get much better. Why? Because the enemy's after that word. He's a thief that comes to steal. The first thing he comes to steal is that word. He'll come to steal that word. He didn't want you. He didn't want you in freedom. He didn't want you liberated. He don't want you to come out of sickness. He wants to keep you sick. He wants to keep you in bondage to those pharmaceuticals. He wants to keep you dis- depressed. He wants you to. Pu- he wants to put you on something, so he can keep an influence on you. you. You're smarter than that. You're wiser than that. Amen. So, what we find here is then we discover that as we go forward. Then Moses then goes back to Pharaoh and begins to give him prophetic words. And notice the first three plagues that he says. He says, I'm going to turn your rivers, ponds, lakes from water to blood. If that doesn't work and you don't change your mind, I'm going to send the plague of frogs. If that doesn't work, I'm going to, the third plague is going to be biting gnats and mosquitoes. Now, it's, it takes all this before the third one, before finally the Egyptian magicians admit this is the finger of God. Only then do they only then do they recognize that God's in this, okay? This isn't just coincidence. This isn't just happenstance. But now something's about to happen in this fourth plague. All of a sudden, we're going to see God begin to make a distinction. And the title of this session today is The Separation. And this is what the Holy Spirit said. There's coming a separation. Amen. And he said, pay close attention to what I'm saying and then look at the world and what they're doing. He said, the separation has already begun. Amen. We're in it right now. Now look at this fourth plague he sent, and it says this, it was a swarm of blood-sucking flies, but on that day I will, God speaks, but on that day I will separate and set apart the land of Goshen, which is where my people are living, so that no swarms of insects will be there, so that you may know without any doubt and acknowledge that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the earth. Hold this, hold this, capture this phrase. The, and acknowledge that I acknowledge that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the earth because in this coming, upcoming next few months, we're going to be talking about natural events and how God sometimes is in natural events. Okay? And we're calling it global warning, that God is sending a global warning to the world. He's sending a global warning to the world. Notice, and we'll probably come back to this when we're teaching that. And I, the Lord, am in the midst of what? The earth. Create, cre- creation defends its creator. Always. It will only let sin go so far, and then it'll say, not beyond this. And it'll stop it. Notice what he said. And I will put a division, a distinction between my people and your people. And by tomorrow, this sign shall be in evidence. And that's how clear he was. I'm going to tell you this today, and this is going to happen tomorrow. And this is what's going to happen. Right here in this church, the Lord's going to say something to us, and and he's going to say, now watch this, this will happen this week. 
This is what's coming. Now, he wants, to, he wants his people to know because he's not the author of confusion. Who is the author of confusion? Satan. He wants you to know. He wants his people to know. So what did he say? I'm going to make a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. They're living in the same land, but they're living over in a housing addition that's been built over here in a, in a part of Egypt that nobody wants to live in. It's called the land of Goshen. And so what's happening here to the Egyptians is these blood-sucking flies are coming in and infesting them and just eating them up physically. And, but it's not happening over here in the land of Goshen where God's people live. Amen? The separation. Say the separation. Look at this next plague. So in the, in the next plague, what we find is the fifth plague. Your livestock, their livestock are going to die, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the sheep. Look what it says in Exodus. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt so that nothing that belongs to the Israelites will die. The Lord set a definite time. This is definitive. Saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. And the Lord did this thing the very next day. And all kinds of the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the Israelites, not one died. So in the fourth plague, we see that God made a separation. The plagues that came upon Egypt would not come upon the Israelites. But in the fifth plague that came, now he separated again. Now he said, not only is it not going to happen to my people, neither is it going to happen to their possessions. The devil's not going to be able to touch your possessions. Amen? Now look at this next one, the sixth plague. And so here he says, there's going to be a plague of bulls and sores. There's going to be heavy rain, hailstones and lightning. Look at what it says in 926. Only in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel lived was there no hell. He's making a distinction. Solomon said this, the thing that was is that which shall be. That which was done is that which shall be done. There he's already set precedent to this. Amen. It's happened once. He's going to do it again. But he's, he's preparing his people, what, with prophetic words. Look at what he says in the next, in the eighth one, we see it's locust. And so they were covered, the visible surface of the land, so that the ground was darkened and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hell had left and there remained not a green thing on the trees of the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. So imagine that, going into your, going into your bedroom, getting in your bed and there's locust. <laughs> Open in your cupboard, there's locust. Sitting down to eat and there's locust in your meatloaf. They're just locusts everywhere, and they've eaten everything in the land except for Goshen. Didn't happen to God's people. I want you to see this. Look at nine. Nine is darkness. Here's the ninth plague. Notice what he said. And the Egyptians could not see one another for three days. Some of you, some of you ladies, you're glad. You're saying, yeah, I'm glad I don't have to see him for three days. And he said, nor did anyone leave his place for three days, but all of the Israelites had supernatural light in their dwellings. I want to tell you, in the day and age which we live in, it is a day to live by faith. To live by faith. It's important that we live by faith. Especially with all the doubt all the negativity that surrounds us to live by faith. Amen. Now, you've heard me say this for at least 10 years. The church is a nation within a nation. We know that according to Scripture. Notice what it says. It says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He's talking about the church a peculiar people that show forth the praises of him when, neg- when you're in a negative circumstance. That's, when, that's why you're peculiar, because when bad things are happening to you, you're still praising God. When your car breaks down, you're not cussing it. You're still praising God. 
when you're having a challenge with the flu and you're not cussing him, you're still praising God. Amen? This is what makes you peculiar. Why are you always happy? Because you're a holy nation. Why are you always saying something good? Because you're a holy nation of peculiar people that show forth the praises of him who called you out of Egypt into Goshen, out of darkness into light, supernatural light in your dwelling. Amen. How many of you believe that? Give the Lord a shout in this house. Come on. Amen. Now, notice this because the separation is so important for us to recognize. This is what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, you're celebrating 25-year anniversary, but the best is yet to come. And, and you need to know that the wheat and the chaff are being separated. The goats and the sheep are being separated. The, there's a separation between the unbeliever and the believer, and it's taking place right now. Amen. And so what happens in the world and with the unbeliever is not going to happen to those who believe and are trusting God. Amen. Now look at this next verse because we're, we're, he says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Now I want you to think about, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, now what do I need to do to separate myself? Okay? Ask yourself that question and then answer it. Write it down. There's more than one thing. Touch not the unclean thing. The unclean thing here, we can go back to our three-part series where we talk about return of the gods. How many of you were here during that series? Okay? Don't touch what Baal, what Molech, what Aphrodite is dishing out. Don't touch it. It's an unclean thing. Go back to, to Return of the Gods, that series. Listen to it in case you weren't here and, or if you want to be reminded of it, go back to it. That is referring to this. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Like any generation that has gone before us, they had a choice. You know what that choice is? Was as simple as Adam and Eve's choice. Didn't seem like a big deal. Don't touch that. Don't eat that. What's the big deal? All they'd ever known was the goodness of God, the love of God, the kindness of God. But all of a sudden, what did they do? They experienced the judgment of God. Don't touch the unclean thing. Don't fall for what Baal is offering, what Moloch is offering. Amen. Be separate. Be you separate. Now, last week in our covered 91 event, 15th year of our celebration, this coincides with the 10th plague being the spirit of death or the death spirit. But that number 15 coincidentally, or I believe it was uh, the timing of God, that number 15, when God speaks the language of numbers, is this. And so this is what we taught. God's perfect grace to overcome the death spirit. That's what 15 means. And so that's what we preached. The 10th plague. Amen? The death spirit. And so the Holy Spirit taught us as he's reteaching Israel's deliverance, he said, notice what he used those prophetic words to do because he is going to bring his people to freedom and liberty. They're going to come out of bondage and they're never going to get in, be in captivity again. Amen. Amen? And that's God's ultimate design and desire for each and every one of us to be free to be liberated forever, never to return back to bondage again, ever. Doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what that bondage is. It could be the spirit of fear. I'm just afraid. It could be I'm a worrier. I'm just worried. It could be I, I, I have anxiety. Uh, that's why I have high blood pressure. That's why I have hypertension. That's why I, he wants you free from that. Amen? 
25 years ago in the church, you never even heard of things like that. But you hear of them today because the Bible says what? In the last days, men's hearts will fail them for fear. They'll just have a heart attack and die right there on the spot because they're afraid. Amen? And we hear about it all the time, don't we? So he told us, he showed us last week, he said, now look at that 10th plague, and here's, I'm going to give you a 21st century application for that. Remember what we said, he taught us. He said, now, Think of the fathers of Israel. Yeah, watch that while you're listening to me. Listen, look, remember the fathers of Israel and remember what they had to do. They had to go pick out a lamb. It had to be spotless without blemish. It had to be a size fitting for their family. If it was a smaller family, uh, if it was like just four people in their family, it was a smaller lamb. If it was uh, eight people in their family, it was a bigger lamb. It had to be fitting for their family. Then they had to sacrifice that lamb and they had to pour the blood of that lamb into a basin. But still, the blood in that basin did no good. It had to be applied to the entrance of their home. And so the Holy Spirit said to me, see how I have shown you the separation that's coming? Now you prophesy it. There's a distinction that's taking place between the one that the enemy would use to imprison you and to those that are my people that have been in bondage. Some of you are out of bondage today. You're living free today. Well, this applies to you too. Amen. He said, but now tell the people, first of all, you as a church, I want you to apply the Psalm 91 to every entrance of your church buildings. And so last Sunday, you saw this. You saw Missy and I, and you saw Corey and Melissa and, and David and Lily. We went to each entrance. We prayed Psalm 91, and then we applied this Psalm 91 sticker, this cover 91 sticker, but it said church on it. You saw that. And then he said, when you pray for them as they go through the line today, at the end of it, you give them a sticker, and you tell them. Now, if you believe, if you don't believe, it won't do you any good. If you're not doing this by faith, it won't do you any good. Well, I'm just doing it because Scott told me, don't do it. It won't do a bit of good. Huh? But if you believe, apply it to the entrance of your home, and the spirit of death will go right past you. Now, something, yeah, give the Lord praise in itself. Now, have you noticed things since COVID? First of all, if you got COVID, there's no condemnation or shame in that. But, but I was warring against COVID before COVID ever showed up. And if you'll remember, if you went back two years before COVID ever showed up, I was preaching on it without knowing what it was. But isn't it interesting, covered 91, COVID-19. Look at it. But I was teaching about safety and protection two years before that plague ever hit. But now, what I've noticed is that the enemy has become very tactful. What used to be a plague for infants called RSV is now a plague for people 60 and over. How did that jump that? That's a plague. That's the spirit of death. The spirit of death is in this country. And the truth is, it's all around the world. It's in every nation. And the Lord is saying to you and I, warning us, I want to separate you. I want to make a distinction. I want to make sure that you understand that the separation is taking place. If you'll just trust me, I'll be faithful to you, and I'll keep you, and I'll protect you, and I'll safeguard you, and I'll, bring your strong, I'll be your strong tower and your fortress. If you'll just run into me and stay there, you will be safe. Amen? And so as we celebrate the faithfulness of God on this 25th anniversary, I wanted to make sure that you got a revelation that you could take home with you 
and that you could recognize that, see, that God always has his people's interest on his heart and on his mind. But what is he after? He's after a transactional relationship with you. More than anything else, more than anything else, he wants to have relationship with you of exchanges and transactions. And this is why he said, take a simple thing like a sticker and apply it. And if you do it by faith, then the spirit of death will pass you over. Amen. Now, if you weren't here last week or if you just didn't have faith last week and all of a sudden you got faith today, amen, we have stickers for you. You can take them and apply them to the entrance of your home. If you'll do that, then God will be faithful. Amen? Do you get anything out of this this morning? Give the Lord praise in this house. We always like to give you a next step, so look at what this next step is. If you believe it, say it. So as you're applying that sticker to your, your entrance, say it. Even if you have to open your Bible, go to Psalm 91, read portions of it, say it. Number two, do it with a grateful heart. Number three, apply it to the entrance of your home by faith. Amen. Go ahead and stand if you would. <laughs> Praise God. Next Sunday, we're going to begin a new series called Skills for Life. Skills for Life. I found that it uh, doesn't matter where you go, it, whether it be a trade, whether it be an investment, financial investment, whether it be sports, your kids are in sports. They're always, all throughout the world, we're always being told you need to develop a skill in that. You need to develop a skill in that. Let me develop your skills in that. And the Lord said to me, he said, I want my people to develop skills for life, spiritual skills for life. So we're going to bring some of the things that uh, Sosi teaches. We're going to bring that. I'm not going to teach what Sosi teaches, but I'm going to bring to light how important Sosi is, our school of spiritual empowerment, as we do this three or four part series. So don't miss that next Sunday. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we receive your word today. We receive your prophetic word that you had for those people going through transition. And we thank you for what you have in store for their lives, their families, their marriages. We thank you, Father, that you have this great plan for each and every one of us to fulfill our primary purpose upon the earth. And so you direct our steps. I know that we as your people hear your voice and a stranger's voice we will not follow. Your voice is clear and accurate and precise and we hear you so clearly above the noise, above the commotion, above the technology, above the loud voices in the room. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, that you direct us and you lead us. You guide us, you protect us, you safeguard us. And we thank you for your loyalty and your goodness to your people. We bless you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, if you have a connect card today right there in front of you, and if there's a prayer request that you have or a praise report that you have, you can fill that out. If, if uh, during that point of where we ministered to people in transition, if you want to write something down there, we want to connect with you. We want to help you have a pastor call you, see if there's anything we can do for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, what we're going to do, I've been just given instructions, so I'm going to do what I've been told. We're going to go out to the coffee bar atrium, and we've got a little bit of a celebration. We also have cake and punch. You ever had dessert before before the meal? Yeah, well, that's what we're going to do today. You're welcome to have a, a cake and punch out there, and then we're just going to uh, pronounce the blessing out there. Amen. So where's my praise and worship team? Are they already out there? Okay, they're out there singing already. So let's, you're dismissed.